There's Doug. Doug's there. I was going to set it on that. Thanks, Kristen, for that music. Welcome. Welcome to all of you to our worship service this morning. Let's begin with um, stating some thanks. I'll suggest some things that we could be thankful for, and you can respond by saying, Thank you, God, our maker. How about cooler air? How about cleaner air? How about rain and wet grass? Yes. And for all the people in this room, thank you, God, our maker. And for the people who are joining us online, thank you, God, our maker. Amen. If you have an announcement, would you come up right now and make it? This is very appropriate because MDS, we can say, thank you, God, our maker. I wanted to give you just a brief report of what's going on right now. You know, back in 2016, Rich Krupp and I went up to Kamii, Idaho, to serve on an MDS project, and we ended up putting siding on one of the three houses that were burned in that fire up there. And we came back with the idea that, you know, Washington and Idaho had raised funds for an MDS tool trailer, and we used it up there. We used them up there. We came back here and we talked around and one Sunday morning, we had a small meeting here at Zion, and we announced that we needed to do that here. And believe it or not, we raised $34,000. 78% of it came from Zion Mennonite Church. 78%. $28,000. We've been talking about MDS. I've been putting announcements in the bulletin board, in, in the bulletin. And, you know, we were hit with the 2020 fires. This MDS trailer, which I've put up here on, on the organ, has made three trips one to Eagle Creek, one to Estacada, one to Scotts Mills, and it's currently sitting in Eagle Creek, Oregon, 35 miles from here. And the people that helped us to organize to buy this trailer, John Colvin, Rich Krupp, Ward Hirschberger, Rick Troyer, who is deceased, 
and Jerry Barkman. Jerry did the installation and manufacture of all the shelving in this beautiful trailer. We have been blessed to use this resource the past two weeks. And for that, we give our thanksgiving. Um, in the bulletin, it talks a little bit about this, but I wanted to draw your attention to the Drift Creek Annual Retreat that's happening November 4th through 6th, I believe it is. And um, if you're interested in coming, it's the celebration. It was supposed to happen of the 60th anniversary. It was supposed to be, I believe, two years ago. Um, so it's the 60-ish celebration of Drift Creek. And um, we'll have birthday cake and other fun things and uh, an auction so if you are coming and want to bring something or if you're not coming but still want to send something to the auction you're welcome to connect with myself or Kristen um, or somebody else who's going and please make sure to register online uh, so that we can account for how many people are coming and plan for food and rooms and things like that Thank you. Kenny, Kenny Tro, I want you to know I have Matt's shoes today. <laughs> Last Sunday I came to church with two different shoes. <laughs> and I didn't realize it until after the service, Kenny was talking to me and he said, Grandpa, what about your shoes? <laughs> so I'm better today. Thank you. So this week, I have been thinking a lot about horizons. What a thing to think about. Horizons. It seems to me that our lives are a series of horizons, and it starts way early. Our first horizon is the walls of our mother's uterus. And the next one is our crib. And the next one is our playpen and then the walls of our house, and then our yard, and then our schoolyard. Horizons, one after another. And I'm encountering, encountering horizons as an older person that I didn't know existed. Horizons, and they aren't just physical. We learned to walk, and there were horizons in doing that. Language horizons. We still work with them. Social, political, and religious horizons. It strikes me that this conversation we're having about gender variability is a horizon. It is for me. And we approach horizons differently, but we all deal with them. And we probably respond differently to what we discover when we go over a horizon. We don't always come out at the same place, but we all deal with the horizon. And I just want to thank you folks for being with us in working with this horizon and encourage you to stay with it. It's important work. Thank you. Let's sing. Please turn to number 182. 182. It might be good to stand <laughs> if you are able. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains roll. That spread the flowing seas abroad and filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that only the sun to rule the tears. The moon shines full and bright, the men and all the stars fulfill. 
Now please turn back to 179. One seventy nine. <laughs> At the dawn of your creation, God, you told man there be God. You divided earth from heaven. You this joyful celebration. May we hear your word anew. May we care for your creation, knowing it's a trust from you. Just as seated. I've been debating about whether to use this song or not, but would you turn to number 405? This is a round which I really don't think might work very well, but I'd like us to sing it anyway, just um, a couple times through in unison. What's the number again? 405. Listen to the words that God has spoken. I was just giving you a how it goes. So let's try again. Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice that began creation. Listen even if you don't understand again. Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice that began creation. Listen even if you don't understand. Sorry, I messed that up. Maybe we'll sing it around first. So again, we have an offering box at the back of the sanctuary. 
you can uh, put your tithes and offerings there. Let's, let's pray for that at this point. We continue our thanksgiving to you, God, our maker, for life and for all the things that you have given us in our lives. Right now, we want to bring gifts and tithes and offerings to you, and we pray, we pray that you would bless them, each one. Amen. Let's stand and um, greet and pass the peace to everyone. The weather changed, didn't it? It was summer, it was summer, it was summer, it was summer, and now suddenly it's just like the calendar says, it's fall. <laughs> All right, so yes, there is smoke. That is so true. There's a lot of fires around. Um, last week, in anticipation for this story, I went to a friend's house and I got some things. What do we find in the fields at this time of year? Seeds, yes, and? 
Yes, these are pumpkins, and they look very different, huh? This is not exactly a pumpkin, but it is in that same family, yeah? yeah. If you'd like to hold one, you can hold one. There you go. They're, they're different. This one's different, too. Sometimes people, sometimes, yeah, this story is kind of about that. Here's one for you to hold, and you'll not want to touch. I did this. I touched the stems, and they're prickly. Sometimes that happens too, right? I don't think, I, you can pass these around, okay, and share them with each other. There you go, and there you go. And that's it for now. Pass them around though. Okay, um, this, this book I found in the library, and it has some Bible verses. I'm not gonna read all of the Bible verses that go with it, but you can go ahead and check this out. I don't know if anybody of your family has checked this book out, but you can do that after we're done, because I'm going to put it back. Um, the Pumpkin Patch Parable. <laughs> See the big red barn and those rolling green fields? That's where the... We're going to listen to the story now. I'm going to tell you a story, okay? And those rolling green fields, that's where the farmer lives way out in the country. It's so far out, the streets don't even have stop signs. The farmer grows lots of different things in those fields. He grows tall green corn and big red tomatoes, long yellow squash and little green peas. People eat that stuff for dinner. You probably eat that too, huh? The best vegetables the farmer grows are pumpkins. Do you think that too? <laughs> they start out as flat oval seeds, almost as big as raisins. <clears throat> One hot June day, soon after school let out, the farmer planted pumpkin seeds just like he did every summer. The seeds disappeared into the ground in nice, neat rows and grew there in the dark all through the 4th of July. Early one morning, a tiny green shoot quietly poked its way out of the soil. Soon, a long green vine stretched across the ground. From that vine, little buds sprouted into wide green leaves. The leaves spread out flat to catch the August sun. Someday, those little green buds would turn into big orange pumpkins, but not yet. The patient farmer waited and waited. The pumpkins began to grow. How different they looked. Some were tall and lean. Some were short and round. Some had lumps and bumps, kind of like the ones that you're holding. All of them were pumpkins. October came at last. The sky was bright blue and the air was cooler. Every night it got dark earlier than it did the night before. I've been noticing that. It was time for the farmer to harvest his pumpkin crop. The farmer's many workers brought lots of ripe pumpkins in from the fields. Which one would he choose first? The farmer picked up one large pumpkin, being very careful not to let it slip his hands. Pumpkins are tough on the outside, but break into smithereens if you drop them. He washed off all the dirt, holding on tight. Next came the messy part. Pumpkins are full of dozens of seed and lots of slimy pulp. The farmer had a special plan for his chosen pumpkin, so the seeds and the slime had to go. He slowly slid a large knife right into the center of the pumpkin. The pumpkin didn't make a sound because vegetables don't talk. If they did, the pumpkin might have said, ouch. Getting the farm, gently, the farmer 
cut a round hole in the top of the pumpkin and pulled out the stem. Squishy, stringy, pulp waited for him inside. Yuck. The farmer pulled out all that slimy pulp and wrapped it up in an old newspaper. Off to the compost pile it went, never to be seen again. Then something really exciting happened. The pumpkin got a new face. The farmer carved a triangle for each eye. Pumpkins have eyes that don't blink or turn away. They see everything. He neatly carved a little square for a nose and then a big, wide smile. What happened next was wonderful. The farmer put a small white candle down inside the pumpkin and touched the wick with a flame. How that pumpkin glowed. As the sky grew darker, the pumpkin on the porch was shining brighter than ever. When people saw the smiling pumpkin, they smiled back. All the neighbors knew that once again, the farmer had turned a simple pumpkin into a simply glorious sight. In the same way, God the Father offers his children the chance to be made new, full of joy, and full of light, shining like stars in the dark world. And that's the end. Let's pray. Dear Creator God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to shine bright in your world and give lots of smiles to people who need love. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I have those pumpkins back now? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I'll bet those seeds that went into the compost pile didn't disappear forever. Now for the scripture this morning, I would like to read Genesis 1 in its entirety. You can follow along or you can close your eyes and just imagine. For me, the creation story has been a horizon, and I'm not through with it yet. The literal meaning of that story is a horizon, and each step in the story is a huge horizon for me. So let's read it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I've had some conversations recently with friends about that. And I'd, I'd like to read it to say, since the beginning, God has been creating the heavens and the earth. I don't know if that does violence to it or not, but it works for me. <laughs> Now the earth was a formless void, and darkness, there was darkness over the deep, and God's spirit hovered over the water. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Evening came, and morning came the first day. God said, let there be a vault in the waters to divide the waters in two. And so it was. God made a vault, and it divided the waters above the vault from the waters under the vault. And it divided sorry, 
God called the vault heaven. Evening came and morning came the second day. God said, let the waters under the heaven come together into a single mass and let dry land appear. And so it was. And God called that dry land earth and the mass of waters seas. And God saw that it was good. God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and fruit trees bearing fruit with their seeds inside on the earth. And so it was. The earth produced vegetation, plants bearing seed in their several kinds, and trees bearing fruit with their seeds inside in their several kinds. God saw that that was good. Evening came and morning came the third day. God said, let there be lights in the vault of heaven to divide day from night and let them indicate festivals and days and years. Let them be lights in the vault of heaven to shine upon the earth. And so it was. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and a smaller light to govern the night <clears throat> and the stars. God set them all in the vault of heaven to shine on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. Evening came and morning came, a fourth day. God said, let the waters teem with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth within the vault of heaven. And so it was. God created great sea serpents and every kind of living creature with which waters teem and every kind of winged creature and God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters of the sea and let the birds multiply upon the earth. Evening came and morning came the fifth day. God said, let the earth produce every kind of living creature cattle, reptiles, and every kind of wild beast. And it was so. God made every kind of wild beast, every kind of cattle, every kind of reptile. God saw that that was good. And God said, let us make man in our own image in the likeness of ourselves, and let them be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of heaven, the cattle, all the wild beasts, all the reptiles that crawl upon the earth. And God created man in the image of himself. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying to them, be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth, conquer it. Be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, and all living animals on the earth. God said, see, I give you all the seed-bearing plants that are upon the whole earth, all the trees and the seed-bearing fruit. This will be your food. To all wild beasts, all birds of the heaven, all living reptiles on the earth, I give the foliage of these plants for food. And so it was. And God saw that all he had made, and indeed it was very good. Evening came and morning came, a sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed with all their array. And on the seventh day, God completed the work that he had been doing he rested on the seventh day after all that work he had been doing. God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on that day he rested from all his work of creating. Such were the origins of heaven and earth when they were created.
The Lord be with you. Good to see you this morning. I'm glad you're here, especially after last week's sermon about Paul and Barnabas parting ways. Thanks for coming back. Today starts a four-week series covering some compelling passages of Scripture. This one, a long one. The series is to help prepare for our November 13th congregational discussion. And throughout the series, I'm going to try to cover just a few Scripture passages that characterize some commonly held perspectives on human sexuality and identity. Let me tell you up front that I'm not making any attempt to present a perspective to end all discussions. Instead, my goal is to use a few of the scripture passages that often come up, along with their various interpretations, with the hope of providing an opportunity to hear and consider different perspectives. It's easy to think something like, <clears throat> I don't want to hear different perspectives. I've already heard different perspectives enough to know how wrong they are. Well, some blame it on the all-elusive algorithm, others the echo chamber that is social media, but hearing and considering different perspectives seems much more difficult than it used to be. Our online browsing history and media streaming habits have been for sale to the highest bidder for quite a while now. Companies use that information to create specifically targeted ads and information, information streams that they know we already have a high likelihood of agreeing with and responding to. The result is that, in general, we no longer gather in common places to hear and process current events next to people with significantly different perspectives than our own. We do that on our own. Instead, we often get our information from sources specifically created and creating a message for us as their identified target demographic. Not too long ago, I was searching for some motor motorcycle parts online, and I think it was within hours or so, my social media ad content along with a YouTube suggestion window was filled with motorcycles, motorcycle parts, and motorcycle apparel. Much of the time, the information we get and perspectives we hear have a healthy do dose of sales pitch added to them. So, in just a couple of weeks, I'm going to do my best to present some of the diverse perspectives of some of the passages. A whole bunch of people who are a whole lot smarter than me have written a whole lot of books on the topics of human sexuality, identity, and the church. It'd be impossible to cover all of that, but I will do what I can to help us get a general sense of how the different perspectives approach a few of these compelling passages. Also, uh, many of you should have received an email on Friday with a prayer guide attached to it. If you didn't and you want one of those emails, uh, please let me know, uh, email the office, and we'll make sure you get that. There are a few printed copies of the prayer guide uh, that we have available at the back. Uh, however, if we run out of those, please let me know. I'll make some more. Prayer is an essential component of this process at Zion. And... Zion Leadership Table has created this prayer guide together as a way for all of us to both journey through scripture and pray together leading up to the vote. Please keep praying after the vote, but the prayer guide, well, that only goes so far. Okay, so Genesis 1 in this really long passage. I wanted to start the series off with Genesis 1 because Genesis 1 reveals a lot about how different Christians approach biblical interpretation. Just this week, I was talking with someone about the upcoming conversation, and it was brought up and acknowledged that it seems to come down simply to how people read Scripture. Some Christians use the term inerrancy, others infallible, others inspired when referring to Scripture. 
how we approach scripture, its interpretation and its application has a lot to do with any issue or perspective we come across. One place where these different approaches to interpreting scripture becomes apparent, or maybe even really one of the first places, is here in Genesis. Specifically, that phrase that comes up, there was evening, there was morning, the first day, shows up, well, seven times through all of this, or at least six, and then the rest. There was evening, there was morning, the second day. So the whole first chapter goes on like this until we get to the end of the sixth day to show the different approaches to reading scripture. I'm going to intentionally look at maybe the extreme examples. The, the extremes of completely literal and completely figurative or purely symbolic. Most Christians really find themselves somewhere in between the two. The biblical inerrancy perspective and its literal approach is that the words on the page mean precisely what they say. So, there was evening and there was morning the first day means what we understand to be a 24-hour period of time passing. That would mean, according to Genesis 1, God did all the work of creating the universe in six 24-hour periods and then rested. A completely figurative approach to Genesis 1 would take the position that Genesis 1 is really more of a general story about creation and morality, that maybe there is or isn't a supreme being somewhere, but the story is just that, a story made up with a hope of giving people meaning and purpose in life. It gives a little bit of meaning, and those, there's no harm in a little bit of meaning, right? But with a literal reading of scripture, uh, some problems arise when science challenges the young earth perspective and things like dinosaurs or fossils have to be explained as maybe God's way of tricking those who don't believe or items that someone placed there to intentionally lead people away from belief in God. Somewhere in the midst of those considerations, science then begins to be viewed as the adversary of Christianity, of the adversary of faith, or at least science is viewed with a healthy do dose of skepticism. The relationship between science and Christianity comes up again when considering the planets. Is the sun the center of the universe? And the topics of evolution, to name a few. But taking a purely literal approach isn't the only perspective with problems. The figurative approach becomes problematic because if none of Genesis 1 is really true, then there's no help whatsoever when it comes to the greatest existential question, why are we here? Is there really a God or is that part meant to be taken figuratively as well? If it's all purely figurative, then why should scripture have any status beyond other stories like fables and fairy tales. In Genesis 1, right here at the beginning of the Bible, we're faced with a dilemma that continues to be struggled with throughout Christianity. How literally do we take the words on the page? Which words on the page should we take literally? And which ones figuratively? And how much should we trust or distrust conclusions of science in the midst of it all? Well, the Mennonite church fits somewhere in the middle, between the extremes of literal inerrancy and purely figurative. It uses language like inspired rather than arrogant, and language like fully reliable and trustworthy when it comes to describing scripture. The Bible's the essential book of the church. The Mennonite church also recognizes that all scripture has its center and fulfillment in Jesus. That means the life, death, and resurrection teachings of Jesus included. They help us understand, interpret, and apply all the rest of Scripture. Genesis 1 has a beautiful and intentional pattern to it. There's poetry and beautiful symmetry in the form and structure of Genesis 1. 
days, one through three, God created environments to be occupied. Day one, light, day, two, sea and sky, three, land, plants, vegetation. And then, once the environments are created, then days four through six, in the same order, God fills those environments. On days four, the sun and the moon that occupy the environment that God had created. Day two, the sea and sky. Well, on day five, that's the fish and the birds. Day three, the lands and vegetation. Day six, animals and humans. Each section ends with the same refrain. There was evening and there was morning the first day. All of this shows an intricate intentionality to the work of creation that God was doing. Another major influence on our task of biblical interpretation, well, that's us. What questions do we have in our minds when we read? And are those questions different from the ones being asked by the people who were inspired by God to write these texts down? I mean, this is, after all, a few thousand years old. The precision brought about by modernism has taught us to ask questions about how and when, specific details. There are things that we want. We want to know when things happen, and from that information, we want to piece together a timeline of history. But maybe Genesis was never meant to be read like a history or astronomy textbook. Maybe Genesis was intended to communicate a theology, a theological perspective that answers the questions of who and why instead of how and when. When science looks at the origins of life and the questions how and when come up, Understanding that the questions we often bring to the text differ from the questions of those who were inspired to write scripture down, they play an important role in our interpretation of what's on the page. Here in Genesis, and all throughout scripture, is it possible for God to instantly create full-grown trees or fully-grown pumpkins with seeds inside fully grown apple trees with ripe apples on them, certainly that is not beyond God. But is that what we believe Genesis is telling us we have to believe to be faithful followers of Jesus? The, prim the primary purpose of Scripture is helping us understand and embrace the salvation God has brought us. This leads me to believe that the purpose of Genesis has much more to do with answering the questions of who, who did it, and why. Well, the who is God. Why? To have a relationship with us. Which leaves room for science, then, to ask its questions that dive into the how and the when. To circle back to my point and introducing this series with Genesis 1. How we read and interpret the Bible is foundational in how our diverse perspectives came to be. Do we take all of Scripture literally? Well, I don't think we do. But which parts should we take literally? How do we decide that? And is science our adversary or our friend in the midst of it? We look at Jesus and we consider those things together as a community, which is part of the process we have entered into together and are working toward. When in addition to all of this, to revealing our different approaches to interpreting Scripture, this passage in Genesis has something else to communicate to us. There is good news. Yes, there is this amazing and beautiful structural pattern and poetry in Genesis 1, revealing a God who created, is creating all things with intentionality, a God who invites us into a relationship. But Genesis 1 also invites us into a pattern of work 
and enjoyment, effort and rest. Now this is really good to hear. I believe this really is good news for us because we've been working hard for quite a while. Long before I came to be your pastor here, you were working to understand working on understanding communication styles, identifying shared areas of interest, wrestling with past hurts, and growing in your ability to navigate conflict. It's all a lot of hard work. We've continued that work together, and it's not always been easy. Last winter and spring, we were meeting with Bill. We were also working through a, a process to prepare for last May's special delegation in Kansas City. A lot of hard work has been put into this, and there is still some work for us on the horizon. But in Genesis, there is good news, because we learn that on the seventh day, God rested. Rested because the work had been completed. Now, it's entirely probable, likely, that our conversation and vote in November will not answer every que question we will ever have about this topic. More questions will come, but it's also good to be reminded that in the midst of challenging work, it won't always be like this. We often need to take a few moments to rest, to take a few breaths together, to celebrate the good work that God has been doing in us and through us. And in our diversity, take a few moments to celebrate each other and the meaningful relationships we have here. Genesis reminds us that there are periods of work, but there are also opportunities for us to rest and enjoy the work that has been accomplished. Let's stand together and respond in singing. Number 529. We're going to take a few moments for our prayer and praise time, and Steve's going to have a microphone that if you would like to share, raise your hand and he will bring that to you. We are um, enjoying the flowers here in front today that, are, that were delivered for Sue Roth's memorial service this afternoon. So um, take note of that. Uh, it's at 2 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We know Jeff and Steph, Noah and Emily, who have attended here in the past, and Sue Roth was Jeff's mother who passed away recently. Anyone like to share?
please remember um, our congregation. I want to say thank, thank you to those in leadership that have put together the prayer guide. And um, just remember to use that this week and the coming weeks before our congregational meeting, too. Let's pray together. This is a prayer from Walter Brugman, who is an American theo theologian. God, you guide over all our comings and goings. Thank you for your presence in our lives. You preside over all our wealth, all our poverty, all our sickness, and all our health, all our despair, and all our hope, all of our living, and all of our dying. And we are grateful. You are the God of all our impossibilities. You have presided over the wondrous transformations in our own lives. You have and will preside over those parts of our lives that we imagine to be closed. And we are grateful. So be your true self, enacting the things impossible for us, that we may yet be whole among the blind who see and the dead who are raised, that we may yet witness your will for peace, your vision for justice, your kingdom coming on this earth. Amen. Please turn to number 71 and stand. We will sing the A verse, number 71. Our God, we thank you for creation. Thank you for all that it entails, including the challenges. Thank you especially that you didn't go away and leave it to survive on, our, on, our, on its own. Draw us together as we do this work. Help us to be supportive and helpful to each other. In Jesus' name, amen.